Hello and welcome. I hope you're doing well. Come and get cozy as I share with you some absolutely terrifying encounters. I post new videos every day, so be sure to hit that subscribe button and the notification bell, and you'll be notified when new daily content arrives on my channel. All right, let's get right into it. If you have encounters of your own you'd like to share, check out the description box below, where you'll find the email sstorysubmissions at gmail.com, where you can send in your submissions to be read on the channel. You can also send in your fan emails. I love hearing from you guys. At Lemon Creek, near Nelson in British Columbia, Mr. John Bringsill, a woodsman and hunter, was picking huckleberries when he suddenly saw a seven to nine foot tall Bigfoot with four inch long gray blue hair covering its body, walking slowly towards him. The creature seemed curious and when it got to within 40 feet of John, he sprinted for his car and drove away. On to the next one. Between Quinnell and Prince George, just off the Caribou Highway in British Columbia in Canada, Mrs. Calhoun was waiting in a small creek, waiting for her daughter to return with her lunch. While waiting, she heard a noise that she at first thought was her daughter and turned to speak to her. She saw the half-human, half-animal eyes of a strange creature that was observing her. She picked up her hunting rifle to protect herself from this creature that appeared human with very long arms. It had small black eyes and blonde brown hair on its chest and long, loose, matted hair on its head. The creature had high cheekbones, a wide, flat nose, a sloping forehead, and a mouth that stuck out. The creature made no noise or sound, though it moved its lips, and then it jumped into the brush and disappeared. On to the next one. I'm a musician from Daytona Beach, Florida. Four or five years ago, my band was recording in Vancouver, B.C. On a few days off, we were invited to go on a camping trip to this place by Port Alberni. However, it is a provincial park and well-known by lots of people. It's about 15 minutes out of town. Let me start by saying it was my first camping trip ever, and we went with a guy we met named Simon. He claimed to be a woodsman, and, by the way, he could climb a tree, I don't doubt him. It was me, my wife, a bandmate named Matt, and his wife, and Simon. We got to our campsite and could not find the guy who sold firewood, so Simon got some little sticks together and made a little fire, and the girls went to town in Port Alberni to get some girl things. I said I would stay and look after the fire when they went and brought some firewood to keep the fire going. I was running around, picking up what I could find, and there was a branch that was kind of broken off this tree, so I was pulling on it, trying to break it off, but it just wouldn't break off, and when I turned around to sort of pull on it, I saw a bear in the bushes. I didn't want to make eye contact with it, so I turned around and started pulling with my back facing the bear. Then I became more than a little worried because I don't know how bears are with people. When I turned around to see what it was doing, I thought it was maybe a simple person, maybe camping with their family. I said something like, hello, or hey you, being nice. I made eye contact for two to three seconds, and it stood right up and walked away. It was walking on two feet, and was more broad than it was tall. It also carried its hands much different than a person would. I don't know how to explain it, but it was weird. It didn't scare me at all, and I thought it was weird. The one thing I remember the most is after it took three or four steps, I couldn't hear it anymore. I just went back to a rented campsite and hung out till Simon and Matt got back. I was not afraid. Later, I asked Simon if there were bears around here. 
Everybody just started laughing at me, saying the first time I go camping, I think I see bears, blah, blah, blah. I never even told my wife the truth. Weird, huh? The one I trusted most. So that's what I have to say. I have seen bears before and I've gotten pretty close and they just seem to pay no attention to human. Like I say, I play in a band and do not like the outdoors, fishing, hunting, camping, any of that stuff but that's what happened to me. Although this was his first camping trip, the witness had seen bears as he was driving along the highway before, and this creature was definitely not a bear. When the witness turned around to see what the creature was doing, he thought it was a human with Down syndrome that was crouching behind some bushes, so he tried to talk to it. The creature then stood up, and he looked in its eyes for three to four seconds, then it walked away. When the creature was standing and facing the witness, its arms were by its side and the palms of the hand were facing the witness, unlike a human with a similar posture would stand. The creature's palms had black skin on them. It had a flat face and nose with a big forehead. Only the chin stuck out a little. The facial skin was black in color. It had hair on its cheeks, but not over the eyes or mouth. The eyes were dark, but they were similar to a human. He could see the sclera, the white part of the eye. There were no visible ears on the creature. The witness was surprised how large the torso of the creature was. It had a massive chest. It had a short neck, but when the creature was walking away, the witness could not see the neck. It was approximately six feet tall, and the witness estimates it weighed a minimum of 350 pounds. It had hair that looked black. It was shiny and well-groomed, two and a half to three inches in length. The witness mentioned the head had a pointy type thing. There was no odor present during the encounter. When the creature walked away from the witness, its body was leaning forward at an angle when it walked. He could not see the neck at this time because of this. If a human had walked at this angle, they would have fallen forward. He also stated that during the encounter, he felt no fear. He was more relieved that it was not a bear. He was surprised by how quietly the creature moved away from him through the bushes. It took three to four steps, and then he couldn't hear it anymore. He returned to the campsite and later asked his friends about bears being in the area. They laughed at him so he didn't tell them about what he saw at the time. The sighting location was in a rainforest near a river. The river is a major salmon spawning area and is a popular salmon fishing spot. There are many types of wildlife in the area, such as deer, squirrel, bird, rabbit, cougar, and bear. On to the next one. at Goose Point near Anaheim Lake in British Columbia. Mr. Harry Squinnis was preparing for bed when his tent flap opened and a hairy monkey face with human eyes peered at him. Harry snatched up a light, which did not work, so he ran outside and threw some petrol onto the campfire. In the light produced, he saw four ape-like creatures lying down about 14 feet away as if trying to hide. They all then jumped up and walked off into the darkness. Harry yelled out to them, but they appeared to ignore him. There were no footprints, but there was one huge lone handprint up on a tree trunk. On to the next one. At Pitt Lake in Westminster County in British Columbia, 25 miles northeast from Vancouver, Two brothers working as prospectors for mining companies were at an elevation of 4,000 feet. There was deep snow everywhere, though it was a sunny day. At noon, they were hiking into a valley when they found tremendous footprints that led to a small frozen stream. A short while later, and further on, they saw a 9 to 10 foot tall hairy humanoid. The creature was covered in auburn hair. The arms were longer than a human's and hung below the knees. 
The hands were huge, like yellow canoe paddles. The creature just stood there, transferring its weight from one foot to the other as its hands went back and forth. The witness sketched the Bigfoot before it walked off. It was very ho-hum. On to the next one. The Black-Eyed Kid Phenomenon Stories of creepy children, often in groups of two or three, who show up outside people's homes or vehicles, and with persistent knocking, and even more persistent begging, ask to be let inside vehicles or residences. The odd behavior of the black-eyed kids often echoes those of the men in black, who are notorious for harassing Bigfoot researchers. They seem socially awkward, somehow out of time and place, and often fail to recognize everyday items like doorbells. However, the most disturbing features of the black-eyed kid is their eyes, reported to be solid black in color. Their ebony oculi inspire fear and panic in witnesses. In a series of events from early 1974, includes repeated Bigfoot activity along with an encounter with something very much like the black-eyed kid phenomenon. Andrew Stone, along with his wife Hilda and their 20-month-old son Michael, had recently moved into their new home in Little Rock, California. They soon noticed that Michael disliked being placed in his crib under the bedroom window. He went into hysterics said Hilda, screaming and crying, and Andy and I would rock him and he'd quiet down until we tried to put him back under that window. He had never acted this way at bedtime before. It was like he sensed something outside the window, and we finally had to put his crib in another part of the room. The family dog was next to act up, acting wildly and scratching at the door to be let out. After the canine refused to let up, the stones relented and let the dog out of their home. They found the poor animal's dismembered body a short time later. He was torn apart, torn to shreds, his head way over there, his tail yards away. Coyotes don't do that. They eat the remains, Hilda recalled in horror. Next, Several fish Andrew had tied on a stringer, 12 feet in the air, disappeared. Around the pole where the fish were tied, leading into a nearby thicket, were huge, three-toed footprints. On several evenings, the stones noticed an eerie quiet about their home. Even the nighttime insects would not chirp. Then the silence would be broken by what Hilda described as a crying horrible noise like a woman screaming. One night, these cries grew louder, as if something was approaching. The dogs in the neighborhood were highly agitated, frantically barking, and found it as if they were trying to break their leashes. The stones then heard something hit the wall of their house with a powerful blow. In March 1974, the stones were returning home in their car when they saw a large figure covered in black hair standing in a shallow stream. He looked like he was scooping something out of the water, maybe fishing, the Hilda said. It looked about twelve feet tall, Andrew added. The creature continued to intrude on the stone's property with regularity. Often, Andrew would hear a clanging sound as the Bigfoot slammed something against the water tank in his backyard. Shining a flashlight in the direction of the sound, Andrew regularly caught sight of red eyes staring back at him from the darkness. The next day, he could see tracks around the tank. The footprints were three-toed and measured as long as 19 inches. Almost nightly, the stone cabin was pelted with rocks preceding the horrid wailing of the creatures, a sound which would in turn awaken Michael, who himself then cried in fear. One night, as Andrew was watching television, he had the sensation of being watched. 
he turned toward his open window to see a Bigfoot peering in at him. I could see the color of its face, said Andrew. His skin was a sandy brown. Now I'm six feet tall, and my window stands higher than me. He was bending over to peek in, so I estimate he was about nine feet tall, built like a barn. The Bigfoot's huge hand was on the window screen. Strangely, it only had four long fingers, each topped with a black claw. It did not appear to have a thumb. The Stones had made plans to move, fearing for the safety of Michael and Hilda, but in late June, other strange visitors appeared on their property. Having fallen asleep watching television, Andrew was awakened by Hilda at about 3.30 a.m. She held her finger to her lips, indicating Andrew should remain quiet. The knob on the front door was turning. Someone seemed to be trying to open it from the outside. Andrew grabbed his shotgun while Hilda slowly unlocked the door. Andrew concealed the gun behind the door and cautiously pulled it open. Two dark-haired young men stood in their front yard. They were clean-cut, and the Stones estimated them to be in their late teens. In unison, the teens said, We don't want to be hurt. Andrew recalled the disconcerting moment. Most people, when they walk up to your house at night, would say something like, Gee, I hate to bother you, or something like that. And you'd think they would knock instead of jiggling the door. The teens could have not seen Stone's shotgun as it was hidden out of sight. Andrew felt it was odd that the first thing they said was that they did not want to be hurt. The Stone's new dog, a replacement for the previous canine, so horribly dismembered, usually barked loudly at the approach of any people. On this occasion, the animal cowered in silent fear a reaction she also manifested when the Bigfoot creature was nearby. The strange teenagers related a story of their car running out of gasoline seven miles away. They asked the Stones to borrow a dime so they could use a payphone and call for help. Andrew noticed, though the boys claimed to have walked seven miles on rural roads, their clothes looked new and clean. Have you ever seen spanking new clothes out of the store like that? And their shoes were shiny black patent leather with round toes, but without a speck of dust on them. Andrew continued, I'm wondering how they could have walked seven miles down a filthy, dusty road without getting their shoes dirty. Nevertheless, Andrew fetched the teenagers a dime. He placed the coin into the palm of one of the boys, and I didn't feel his hand, Andrew said. I was very deliberate to get it right into his hands, as I didn't want it to drop in the dirt and get lost, because it was the only dime I had. There was nothing there, like I hadn't even done it. After closing the door, Andrew realized the phone booth, which was some 200 yards down the hill from his cabin, did not have a light. He grabbed a flashlight and went outside, intent on offering it to the teenagers. They had disappeared. Doan walked down the dirt road, trying to find the boys. They were nowhere around, said Doan. Nowhere. There were no cars, no noise. The crickets weren't going. The frogs weren't croaking. And I got the eeriest feeling I ever had, Hilda added. It sounds like we were dreaming but we were wide awake, and Andy doesn't drink, and they never brought back our dime. While he recalled in detail what the teenagers were wearing and the other events of that night, Andrew Stone was troubled by two things. First, the faces of the boys were a blur in his memory, and perhaps the most disturbing of all, Stone could not recall seeing the eyes of his visitors. If you have encounters of your own you'd like to share, check out the description box below, where you'll find the email sstorysubmissions at gmail.com, where you can send in your submissions to be read on the channel.
You can also send in your fan emails. I love hearing from you guys. I hope you enjoyed those encounters. And if you did, be sure to hit that like button, leave a comment, and subscribe. I post new content every single day, so be sure to hit that notification bell, and you'll be notified exactly when that new content arrives on my channel. Again, thank you so much, and until next time, bye!